Kuriame profesoriui, na ką gerskelbėme trumpą kavos per traukėlę ir kviečiame jūs visus sugrįžti į antrąją konferencijos dalį po 12.15, nes kavų tai irgi vienas iš laimės intaksui labai svarbių dalykų. Taip kad skaniaus kautės. Bendrau kažkaus su bendruomenės antrąją dalį. Na ką, dabar turėsime progą pasiklausyti Viešnios and Berit Rafos. Amžiai Palankios Norvegijos centro projektų vadovės ir jį turi didelę patirtį kuriant amžių draugiškas bendruomenės. Pasak Viešnios per pastaruosius dešimt metų Norvegijoje pavyko geriau įtraukti į vyresnio amžiaus žmonės į senatvėjį Palankių miestų ir bendruomenių kūrimą. Dėmesys buvo sutelktas nei tai, ką daryti vyresnio amžiaus žmonėms, o į tai, ką daryti kartu visiems su jais. Pasitikime, Ann Berit Rafos su pranešimu amžiui palanki plėtra Norvegijoje. It's a pleasure to be here in beautiful Vilnius, in this beautiful building as well. Um, thank you for inviting me. I will talk about age-friendly development in Norway. So, Norway is a country with 5.5 million inhabitants. In terms of the percentage of the population 80 years and older, it's only 8% at the moment. This was the map I was given by the ministry, so this is what I'm using. But since we have spoken about 65 plus a lot earlier today, I will say that in Norway, in less than six years, there will be more people over 65 than under 20. So the population is changing dramatically in Norway as well. The age-friendly journey in Norway started with two cities. I worked in the city of Oslo, the capital at the time. We joined the global network back in 2014, and we helped another city, Trondheim, to join in 2050. We went together and lobbied. We talked about this at conferences, at meetings, and we tried to raise awareness of the age friendly development. And we managed to gain a lot of interest, so it was picked up at the national level. We, um, there was a strategy launched in 2016, a strategy for an age-friendly Norway. More years, more opportunities. This was followed by a national reform, a quality reform for older people in 2017-2018. A full life, all your life. And this is really where we had the age-friendly agenda introduced. And this was very much the start to the centre of which I'm a part. At the moment, we have a new reform very excited about this. It's community and independence live safely at home. We have four main areas that we'll focus on. Age-friendly communities, in terms of housing, more planning and adapting. We look at competent and independent workforce and safety for patients and support for carers. Now the centre has been given a special responsibility to look after the first topic, age-friendly uh, local communities. But we're also working together with the State Housing Bank on the housing, the planning and adapting. And we'll leave the other areas to our colleagues in the directorate. But I know that this audience today, there are representatives from different uh, ministries. So I will say that this is a very exciting reform because it has been developed by seven different ministries. Yes, the Ministry of Health is the main ministry responsible, but it's been developed across ministries and will be implemented across ministries. So the Centre for Norway, for an age friendly Norway, we're part of the directorate, but we're also a unit and an office in and of ourselves. At the moment we have seven people working um, in the centre. The photo is from the beautiful city of Ålesund, where we are placed. Uh, the government sometimes places different uh, agencies in other parts of the country, so that not everything is in the capital. So we're a result of that. Um, we try and raise awareness and knowledge about the age friendly development. Uh, we also try and work with the individuals so that they all plan better for their old age. We have a major campaign that we call Plan a Little. Uh, it's aimed at 55 plus uh, and it's a lot about housing, it's about economy, it's about your time and what to do with all these extra years we now get as pensioners. 
But we don't do this, you need to, and you should be doing this. It's more, where would you like to live? What's important to you where you live? What services are important to you in the future? Do you live in a separate house, maybe on a hill with many stairs? Maybe just start thinking a little bit about this. And of course we get a lot of reaction because it's at 55 plus. What? I need to think about this already at 55? Yes, you need to start, look, keep it at the back. Do I want to live with family? Do I want to live with friends? Do I need to do something about where I live? We're hoping, with a lot of videos and articles and advice, we're hoping to make people make the decisions maybe a bit earlier, maybe before something happens and you absolutely have to move. We also work on involving older people. We have a long-standing tradition for councils for older people in Norway. It's mandatory to have a council for older people in every city and community. Uh, we have created a special training program for councils for older people. Um, but we also want to involve older people in other arenas and settings. So it's a broad involvement of older people. We have a national network of age friendly cities and communities. We try here to raise, again, awareness and knowledge and share examples. But it's not enough working with only cities and communities. We really need to work also with academia and businesses and organizations. So in order to do that, we've created a partnership platform. Uh, we focus very much on this cross-sectoral collaboration because we have to. This is not something that we can solve in the health and care sector alone. We really need to involve everyone. We are also the secretariat for a government national council for an age friendly in Norway. And some of our keywords are sustainable development, inclusive design or universal design, people call it different things, and ageism. So the two levels that we try and operate are as the individual level, try and enable participation uh, of older people, that they can contribute, and then at the systemic level to get the different organizations and businesses and cities and communities involved. So the National Network of age friendly Cities and Communities, we have 230 members at the moment. Uh, the total number of cities and communities in Norway is 356. So it means we cover about 60-70% of all the cities and communities. And we have the smallest uh, municipality with 200 inhabitants, but we also have the capital. So we have the whole range and we have the whole country. These are our main areas of focus. So we look at the outside, the outdoor environments, the universal design, the planning of these areas. We look at housing and transport. In terms of activities and inclusions, we're very much concerned about culture and volunteering and communication and co-creation. Now when you look at this list, which is clearly influenced and we use the WHO model and framework, what are you missing here? We're missing health and social care. And that's not because we don't work very closely with that sector, it's because we need to get all the others involved. They need to feel that it's their responsibility as well. They need to get involved. So, in order to um, create more awareness, but also increase the knowledge in this development, we organize a lot of activities for the network. We do webinars for the different topics, and the focus is always to have examples. We find that the cities and communities, this is what they respond best to, given that we exemplify what we mean. So if we're talking about housing, we have housing examples. If we're talking about transport, we have examples for that. But we organize webinars on a regular basis. We also do conferences. We see that travel has been reduced, uh, especially after the pandemic, but there is still that need to meet physically. So we organize some national conferences and some regional conferences. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning, and we offer counseling to any of the cities and communities who might like to take advantage of that. And that can be counseling into how do we integrate this into our plans, or how do we develop a plan, or how do we implement measures. We counsel on all these different levels. We participate in projects, they can be research projects or development projects in the cities and communities. And then we visit. 
Um, I can tell you that I travel a lot and I've come to know my own country incredibly well. I've been to the smallest and peculiar places as well as the cities, which I love, I really do, because I really believe that you need to be on the ground. You need to hear what questions do the older people have, what are their concerns, but also what are the politicians' concerns and the administration. I need to be out there to listen to this so that I can really take that back and see what we can do at national level. So we take part in local conferences or meetings, um, different steering committees, whatever the cities and communities invite us to and find it useful that we can join them at. We develop tools, a lot of different handbooks and guidebooks, but also videos and things that can help the cities and communities work more age friendly. And for the last few years, we've also, together with the cities and communities, organized generation games which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the top photo there, the lovely old lady with her grandson. It's about creating activities across ages. Um, so it's physical activity and fun. And these, this is, I guess, one of our main tools to combat ageism, getting all these generations to come together. So far, most of the cities and communities have really focused on the outdoor spaces and meeting places. And the reason for that also has to do with the pandemic, because we saw the need for that. We need to be better at it. We need to have more of it. And in terms of the outdoor spaces, we look at benches, are there enough seating places, lighting, public facilities, are there enough places to walk and exercise? When I started working on the Edge Family Agenda, now almost 11 years ago, older people impressed on me. There are two things that prevent us from going outside. One is access to benches, and the other is access to public toilets. Now, toilets is a bit trickier and more regulation and finances to be involved in doing that. doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we should. But benches, everyone can do benches. And it's such a useful tool. And it makes older people, in fact all of us, you know, happier to go out. We can sit down, have a break, have a conversation. It's a personal favourite of mine, benches. I could talk for hours about it. But we've created a specification of what an age 20 bench should be. And we've done this together with older people, but also universal design experts. And we think that, you know, in terms of when you think of the outdoor spaces, think also about um, what's close by. Uh, can you have better signage? Can you have something happening where you're sitting? Um, so outdoor spaces is a big area. Then we also look at local community development. The photo at the bottom you see, it's an industrial city. And the best location of the whole the factories are down by the water. This was closed off, no one could use it. We have, together with them, transformed this area. It's now open, anyone can come and use it. There are benches, there's culture, there's art, you can go swimming. Um, they've really opened it up and made it accessible and inclusive. This is what we need to do more and more, because in Norway at least, and most other places, the local communities are geared towards the car and or industry and business, so we need to turn it to be more human-centered. And we also work on transport, which is a big issue. And it's an issue both in the cities, but also in rural communities. In the cities, you may have different uh, transport opportunities, trams or buses or metro, but they're not really accessible. And in rural communities, you simply don't have enough transport solutions. So we need to be more creative and find out how we can work across the different sectors to create more transport solutions. Because it doesn't help to have all these wonderful activities for older people if you can't get there. So transport is a big issue with us. In terms of housing, we try and look at different models of housing. Can we get better at the private-public partnership? Can we find different financial models? Can we work on different architecture? So we try and gather a lot of good examples that can inspire others when they're now building new housing. Continuing a little bit with the examples, at the top you see another city that has created some really exciting housing models. What they have focused on is getting a, as good a relationship with the private sector as possible. You know, the private sector is often blamed on oh, their only concern in making money, not taking the full social responsibility. Here they did, they said, okay, they said to the city, what do you need us to do? And the city said, well, we need to have housing that's accessible 
obviously. But we also need housing that can accommodate different economies. So they've created apartments, some are index regulated and some are market regulated. So it just means that there's more flexibility and accessibility, even if you have different uh, economies. The other photo at the top is a form of social housing in H20 housing complex. Um, it's centered around a square, which is what we used to do before as well. Uh, they live in smaller units, but this allows for more common rooms inside and outside that they share. They share the costs and they share the activities and the upkeep. So this is becoming more and more popular. In terms of the outdoor areas, we focus a lot on accessibility, but we also try and think about the census. You know, can, where we place benches or where we have activities, can you have flowers, can you have berries, can you have herbs, can you have sites that you can enjoy to try and have a more diverse outside area. So this red bench uh, is a photo I've taken. It's got a beautiful view. Sometimes you'll find benches that are just facing a wall or right in, in the forest. The intention is good, but you can think so much better. We can all do better in terms of stimulating senses and wanting us to come out. Uh, this is really what cities and communities want to do as well, stimulate something. You want to come out. You feel included. You feel welcomed. There's something that makes you come out. Maybe there's a storytelling by the benches. Something is happening. Now, <coughs> co-creation, so involving older people in the different processes and strategies and work is so important. And I tell the citizen communities, this is perhaps the most important investment that you make. You need to involve the people who are going to use your outdoor spaces or come to the activities you create or live in the houses that you built. So, co-creation with citizens is incredibly important, but I've also recently become more and more um, involved in co-creation internally in the cities and communities, because they need it just as well as the citizens. So, what some cities have been doing, which is very exciting, they gather people from different uh, departments. You know, it can be planning, it can be housing, it can be mobility, culture, health. So they come together, and then they create a common understanding. What is the age-friendly agenda? What is this cross-sectorial collaboration? And one city, for example, that was very creative, the project manager there created three routes in the city that all the people at the meeting had to experience. But the way they had to experience it was with glasses, simulating what your sight is going to be when you get older, uh, different things on your arms and your legs, simulating the stiffness that you might have when you get older, uh, or walkers or wheelchair. Now, I will say the people at the meeting looked slightly terrified uh, when she told them this, but they all did it. And I have to say, I think they felt confident before, because this is a city who's won prizes for universal design. So they thought, no, oh, this would be fine, this would be good. It wasn't. They tried to use the benches, they couldn't get down, they couldn't get up. Um, lighting was not good, and signs, and they were all a bit embarrassed at the end, said, okay, we need to go back, this is not good enough, we need to do something. So I love this approach of also trying to raise awareness within the cities of communities, what is this really going to be like? Now, the way you can do this, of course, uh, varies a lot. Uh, we have a long-standing tradition of town hall meetings. So you gather a lot of people together, maybe at the start of a political period or the start of a project. It's still a good way of having a lot of people come together to get information, but it's not perhaps the most interactive way. And you'll find the same people raising their hands and always asking questions or being critical. So you need to have different ways of involving um, older people. So maybe you have smaller meetings, maybe you have conferences or workshops, maybe you go out also with older people and experience what is it like to go outside and be outside both during daytime and nighttime. Um, this is probably my favorite way of co-creation because you get tactile hands-on experiences. Our questionnaires were used a lot in the pandemic, obviously, because we couldn't meet, but has continued to be popular because you may then, in questionnaires, reach the younger part of the population. And we want to reach the whole population. We want to reach people who are getting older tomorrow, and we want to reach people who are older today so that we get the full picture. 
I think the main thing is that you try different methods so that you get as good an insight as possible into what are the local needs and the local wishes and you get the best local solutions as well. Because we also know that what might be right or important in one city may not be the most important thing in the neighbouring city or another city. So you need to get this local insight. Now, <clears throat> with the H family work, we always try and look at the current government, because we have changes of government, we all do, local and national. So you also always need to look at what is at the top of the agenda for the current government. And our government at the moment is very much on the sustainable development agenda and digitalization. So we try and link H family up to these policies. We've developed a number of tools. This is a handbook I developed together with communities. It's very practical. It talks about the different topics. It talks about solutions, examples, and checklists. It also has a roadmap that you can use in order to learn about how you organize this work, who should be involved, what milestones can you have, the structure of it. The Norwegian Association of Architects has created this handbook. Uh, which is more about the social development, community development, but it complements the other handbook really well. Recently, uh, we've developed this handbook, which is all about meeting spaces and outdoor places. Um, and this is one of my favourites because all these initiatives that we've collected from all around the country, we also did a series of webinars, four webinars on these topics. They've all come into fruition because of co-creation. So, older people in particular have been able to have their say, what's important to us? We want a place for swimming, or we want a hiking trail, or we want a fishing spot. Whatever, these initiatives have come to life due to co-creation. So we work at national level, we have a big national network, but in recent years we also see that there has been a lot of regional networks. So our communities coming together regionally to work which I find is really good. You can have more local collaboration that way. We also look very much to the Nordic network and to the global network for inspiration and learning. So the rationale that we use and we use for the cities and communities as well is that by working on the age friendly agenda, by implementing age friendly initiatives, you may be able to reduce the pressure and the costs and need for health and social care services. Also, it's a big contributor to the social um, sustainable development agenda. And we get asked a lot, what is age friendly? Why don't we say generation friendly or human friendly? Or isn't universal design enough that's good for everyone? But age friendly is a fantastic approach. And it has its roots in the demographic change, make no mistake. But what you do is good for all ages. And that's so important to keep in mind. Lastly, I just want to remind you that it's important to involve. Involve older people, involve the different sectors. Support anyone who wants to work with the age family agenda. Make it relevant to different policies and strategies. Be careful of the language you use as well, so that it's a positive, inclusive language about getting older, older people. That way you can also create ownership that we all want to contribute to a society where we can look forward to getting older. And that's where I hope we'll get. Thank you. Thank you very much, but I think we have a question, yes? So if you don't mind, yes. Ir turiu klausimą, 
kaip pasiu sprendžiama patalpų klausimas neatlyginti, ar jūs turite susimokėti pinigus už užimamas patalpas tenai, nu, atitinkamo asociacijos padalinių arba didžiausių organizacijų, kurios susiminėja seniorų interesų atstovavimą ir antras klausimas, iš ko yra finansuojamas seniorų, seniorom įdomios veiklas, įdomios ir įkalingos veiklas. Good questions both. Um, first of all, um, don't be discouraged. I am sure that you are already doing great things and you'll just do more in the future. It's taken us a long time as well to come here. So don't be discouraged by that. You will get there. And I'm sure you're doing great stuff already. Uh, for the most part, the cities and communities themselves provide premises for where organizations like yourselves or councils for older people can come together to either have meetings or have activities. They also facilitate for different organizations to use the public premises for their activities. Um, some organizations, member organizations, might have some funding of their own, so they might then have some buildings and facilities and premises where they can do this. Ar mes atsakėme jūsų klausimą? Dar vienas klausimą, aš taip mane. Arčiau mikrofoną, jeigu galima. Norėčiau paklausti dėl finansavimo. Kaip vyksta tų bendruomenių finansavimas, kokia sistema yra? Dėkui. Ar jūsų sakyti, jūsų sakyti? in general, or for activities for older people, or... Yes, so funding comes from taxation, largely. Um, so the uh, citizen communities uh, taxate their uh, inhabitants, so that's where the main source of income comes from. And of course, property tax, different sorts of taxes also for businesses. Um, that's how we then provide the services, if they're health and care services or any other service. No, that was not your question. I think she needs the microphone again. activities. <laughs> As fair as possible a distribution, the different organizations who want to create activities have to apply every budget of the year for their funding. So then they have to outline what activities they have and they apply for, to the public authorities for funding. Mūsų valstybinės institucijos, nu, įsitikinusios, kad jos geriau žino, ko reikia seniorom ir ko jie nori, dėl to jie nuleidžia mums savo, kokias tai programas, jau, nu, patikslinę, kaip jie įsivaizduoja. Dėja, jie nesitarė su mūsų seniorų organizacijom ir niekad dar nebuvo taip įvykę, kad mes išreiškia savo iniciatyvą, o ministerijos ten arba kitos institucijos būtent pagal mūsų pageidavimus sukurtų kokį tai projektą ir skirtų tam finansavimą. Kaip pas jūs sprendžiame šitie klausimai? Turbūt pagrindinis klausimas, jeigu galima, aš truputį sukonkretinsiu, kaip vyksta dialogas tarp seniorų ir vyriausybinių organizacijų, kurios priema sprendimą, ką finansuoti, o ko nefinansuoti? Sometimes it looks that from the office in the government, they know better. This is how they feel. So how, it, how does that dialogue work in, uh, in your country? I think what really helps us is that we have a long-standing tradition of councils for older people. So it's actually mandated by law that every municipality has to have a council for older people. So they would be your voice. They then influence the local, regional and national authorities of what their needs are, where they should put their money, 
then different organizations apply for money, but the councils for older people are so important. They really are the voice of older people in terms of the services that they need or the activities they might take part of. So they are the ones really giving insight into the local and national uh, government. And what if, uh, as the building, so close, but what if uh, those uh, kind of interests the interests differ? Let's say uh, the council, the elderly council, thinks that they need one thing, but the government thinks that they need other thing, and the clash appears. How, what's the, what's the solution method? Do the, I mean, are there any examples like that? I can't generalize on that because that would be up to every local government what they would prioritize and how they would solve this. There's no there's no attack in your two calls, then. Uh, you know, we can't change and express it on the one hand how it works, but the priority is to be able to do it, like the state and the government, but the senior staff turns a very small dialogue. Or do we have a question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. for this wonderful presentation. It's uh, very nice to see those horizontal view on that all uh, family policy because you mentioned very important things about the working families and about the aging uh, possibilities and about all this, about the needs all, of all the society. You know? It's not just the needs for some aging persons or some aging people. It's the needs of each of us. Uh, and the question is, uh, do you have some some examples of participation or some examples of uh, working together, NGOs of uh, aging uh, uh, people and NGOs of family points, or, or families NGOs. Uh, and the question is because uh, we see that uh, there's a huge problem of uh, family carriers and the Lithuania is a special, terrible needs. And of course, we have some huge problem of working families because they are like a sandwich uh, population. You know, we have to care of the children, and then we have to care of the parents too. And uh, we have still not enough uh, of the support of the social services. And those presentations before show that it's not enough. Quite, it's almost zero usually in some regions and uh, so that's uh, we are looking for possibilities to participate, participate together with the aging NGOs and of course advocate of needs um, on the family needs and family policy needs. Thank you. From what I can see out in the local communities, um, they invite to collaboration across sectors, across organizations and private and public and that is something that we encourage strongly as well. So there would be local examples, I couldn't name them here, but I know that the cities and communities have a mandate, if you like, have a task from the government, also through the age family agenda, which is about involving, it's about cross-sectorial. And then they come together, the different NGOs, the different levels of government and private and public sector to solve this. They do they do, do that. But we are having to work on that agenda for many years to come as well to really get the different sectors together, not work in silos as they do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.